everybody. Welcome to another live session of this whole webinar series, which I am doing. And uh, today we are having Dr. Kendi Berry with us and we are just waiting for him to, uh, to join in. Uh, it's been quite an exciting time, quite a challenging time organizing all these webinars because there is a huge uh, time difference between trying to connect with people from all parts of the, of the, of the world. And yes, we have Dr. Berry with us. He has joined in. Hello. Hello, Dr. Ken. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Hello. Absolutely. It's my honor and my pleasure all the way from India. And greetings from India, uh, Dr. Ken. It's so great that, uh, is, it, is it very comfortable for you? Or could you? Can you hear me? Can you see me? Yes, my audio and video of you is great. How is my audio and video? Absolutely perfect. Crystal clear. Beautiful. Beautiful. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Good evening. I think it's almost bedtime there, yes? Yes, it is. But uh, it's not always bedtime. But yeah, it's 8.30. And it's actually really so good to, after you know hearing all your YouTube videos and being consistently following them, it's so great to see you live. And it's, it's an, indeed such an such a honor to have you here. And if I may just share a little about what I'm trying to do, uh, Dr. Berry, is that uh, I'm trying to connect with all of you whom I considered my mentors <clears throat> and my gurus, if you may, uh, that's how we speak in India, about the people who are working on the low carb and the keto diet to build up. Um, we know how it works all around with health. And it is something which is not really uh, uh, well known in India. And there's, I, I'm facing quite an amount of uh, uh, resistance from everybody about when it comes to the low carb. And I wanted to do these whole webinar series, basically utilize this whole period of the COVID pandemic to connect with all of you to, uh, to just, you know, build up these series to promote health awareness about how we have it all wrong and who knows it better than all of you who've been doing all this great work here. So please, I welcome you all the way from India. It's great to have you live with me and we will be touching upon a lot of topics. But before we start, I just want to, you know, just give a very, very short introduction because words are not sufficient to talk about all the work you are, you are doing and it, it's just amazing and so Thank many you. people told me that they are huge fans and they are been you know <clears throat> all your youtube videos and uh, those are those are great videos i have to compliment they they are short and they are to the point and you just touch upon that topic and you and you know you literally din your point across and then you're all done with it so those are those are really great Thank so, you. Uh, so Dr. Dr. Uh, Dr. Berry is a practicing board certified physician. Just one second. I'm also a little technologically challenged. <laughs> no worries. So, so he's a practicing board certified physician. And of course, we all know that he's an Amazon best-selling author, a passionate advocate of health on his very, very famous and diligently followed YouTube channel. And he has over a million subscribers. We all know that. And he's also active in his own community of Camden, Tennessee, where he has been practicing at the Berry Clinic since 2003. And yes, I agree. He's known for his direct, no-nonsense approach to health and wellness, which is something I really admire in you. And after signing with the Victoria Bell Publishing House this year, Dr. Berry just released a second edition of his best-selling book, Lies, My Doctor Told Me. <laughs> <laughs> that I wanted you, I wanted the topic to be this, but then you know, I thought it's going to be really controversial for our country. So he's also in the process of writing his second book called Common Sense Keto for Type 2 Diabetes. He looks forward to working with the real people of the world in continuing his mission to bring an end to obesity and type 2 diabetes epidemics, uh, epidemic, along with bringing awareness to such tish, uh, issues like thyroid health and hormone optimization. And thank you so much, Dr. Berry, for being here with us today. It's a matter of great honor and great pleasure. It's a pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. Absolutely. So um, the, the main topic which I really wanted you to, to touch upon and today I heard, I again reheard your wonderful YouTube video with uh, Dr. Paul about all about mental health and every time I hear it, it's just, you know, I don't know, it brings such emotions in, in my heart because it's, it's just amazing 
how mental health has been you know to quite an extent being be become so commercialized and so misunderstood so <clears throat> wrongly understood i would just like you to take up from there i would not absolutely contribute anything my thoughts you are the guru at it could you please let us know mental health is there any diet for this what is the connection between mental health and nutrition yeah it's and it's that's a, a compelling question because you're absolutely right mental health has been commercialized and uh, many many doctors and other uh, medical and nutrition leaders feel like that the psychiatric uh, powers that be have kind of sold out to big pharma they're they're much less uh, eager to talk about diet and nutrition and lifestyle when it comes to medical health their their knee-jerk response their immediate initial response is to pull out their prescription pad and write a prescription. And it's often not for just one pill. It's often for two or three or even four medications that this person uh, is now to take daily for evidently the rest of their life. And it, it beggars belief because, I mean, is this person broken? Does this person, do they have a proven uh, chemical deficiency or a, a, I mean, do they have a neurotransmitter deficiency? Do we know that? Did the doctor do a lumbar puncture or a spinal tap and check the amount of neurotransmitters in their cerebrospinal fluid? No, no, they did not. And so what they're being treated for is a presumed, presumed. neurotransmitter deficiency. Mm -hmm. uh, they, oh, it's your serotonin, oh, it's your dopamine. Uh, you know, they pick a, a neurotransmitter then they prescribed them a medication that in theory will improve the levels of that neurotransmitter, although that's never been proven either. Mm -hmm. And so basically the treatment of mental health with prescription medications is completely theoretical. And, and actually that's giving it too much credit. It's really based on weak hypotheses that have never been proven in the lab or in the clinic. And it's, it's very sad to watch this unfold and to watch uh, medical doctors and, and uh, psychological experts basically sell out to the big pharmaceutical corporations and just say, okay, yeah, the first line therapy for depression, for anxiety, for any medical condition is going to be a prescription medication. And I think that's sad. I think there's many other things that people can do that don't involve taking a, an expensive side effect laden pill every day. It's, it's, and it's, it's like just when this whole pandemic happened, um, everybody was anxious, everybody was stressed. And I uh, saw so many of young people being just prescribed, as you say, not one, but a multitude of uh, uh, medicines. And as you very correctly say, said that there are, there, you, you have those uh, moments of anxiety, moments of depression, moments of feeling blue. Now, how do you, it, it, it's just such a general phenomena which does happen. And when do you really say that this is a person who is, really depressed and really anxious and when do you say that these are just phases these are ups and downs and coming to and coming to the main thing the nutrition i think we've just had it all wrong i, I i've seen that in me uh, i had it all wrong you know and even today maybe a couple of days if i skip magnesium or i skip the nutrient dense food for whatever reasons not skip but maybe miss uh, you know a couple of those kind of things i can feel uh, you know the with, with all this going on around me um, a, sun, a sense of blues <clears throat> setting in well yes. maybe if i would be just going to a, a consultant of a, a medicine guy and asking them Ki, what, am I, what am i supposed to do i would definitely i would have been under some kind of a prescription till now Yep, so, absolutely. And so you're, you, you touched on a point that I think is important enough to mention. Mental health, whether we're talking about depression or anxiety or any of the other diagnoses, it, it occurs on a spectrum. It's not mm -hmm. a black or white question. Is, mm -hmm. is this person depressed or not? Mm -hmm. Now, there are, there are uh, defined criteria for the official diagnosis of depression or OCD or anxiety or ADD mm -hmm. or autism. 
but that all of the symptoms occur on a spectrum. And so what that means is all of us have days where we feel elated and, and perhaps almost manic. We're just excited. We're full of energy. We just are running, running and gunning, as we say. Yes. And, and, but is that mania? No, that's, you're just having a really good day. Also, all of us have bad days where we feel kind of down and we, we don't feel motivated and we're just, we want to stay in bed or on the couch all day. And so is that depression? Well, no, you're just having a bad day. But the, the problem comes from the, the laws of human nature that must be uh, recognized in the doctor-patient relationship. When a, doctor, when a patient goes to a doctor, there is an expectation that that doctor will do something for the patient. And so if the doctor says, oh, well, you're just having a bad few weeks. I mean, you're not sick. You just, you know, you're in the middle of a pandemic. You're also in the middle of an economic downturn. Mm -hmm. Both mm -hmm. of those things take you out, take you away from uh, interactions with people. You're, you're interacting with few, far fewer people face to face now. That will bring your mood down. Mm. You're also, we're in a financial, you know, some would say a collapse, some would just say a contraction, but that is depressing. It is normal to be depressed if bad things are happening. That's a normal reaction, and that, mm. that, that's not uh, pathology. That's not a disease. Yeah. It's normal during this time of social isolation and economic downturn. It's normal to feel down. It's normal to, to, to be kind of depressed about the, the outlook for the future. That is not a disease. That, that, and but, but again, let's go back to our patient and doctor interaction. That doctor feels compelled to do something for that patient. And indeed, that patient expects the doctor to Absolutely. do something. Hmm. to help me, right? And so what if that doctor just said, look, you're in the middle of a, a pandemic. You're in the middle of a social, of, of a social uh, upheaval. You're in the middle of an economic downturn. It's completely normal for you to be down in the dumps and not feel good and want to stay in bed and not be motivated. You're not sick. You just are reacting to what's mm -hmm. going on in your world. Mm -hmm. Go home and, and just try to, try, you know, plant, plant a small garden, start a small business, uh, try to try to help your neighbor try to help your family that's what you should do go for a go for a walk every morning get it get go for a 30 minute walk every morning in the morning sun try to go to bed 30 minutes earlier every night those are the things that will make you feel better you can quickly see that the average patient <laughs> would feel slighted. <laughs> yeah. they would be like oh thanks for nothing doctor you didn't i mean uh, duh i knew that you didn't have to tell me those things would make me feel better. I already knew that. I'm just, I don't want to do them. Mm -hmm. And then you can also look at this from the doctor's perspective. I just gave this person some advice that my grandmother might have given me <laughs> when I was a teenager, right? And so the patient leaves not feeling satisfied that something was done. Mm -hmm. And the doctor leaves that interaction feeling like I didn't really help them. I just gave them some common sense advice. So everybody walks away from that transaction uh, uh, at least a little bit unhappy and unsatisfied. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? And so that's why if the doctor has a tool called a prescription pad yeah. with all these bullets at the pharmacy called prescription medications, mm -hmm. if they write that prescription, even if it won't help at all, mm -hmm. the patient leaves happy because they've got that prescription. And the doctor leaves that, that transaction feeling justified that, that I am a very wise and knowledgeable doctor. I have given this patient some magic medicine to help their condition. Does that make sense? And so you can see the human nature in that interaction, it almost forces patients to expect a pill and almost forces doctors to prescribe a pill. But that the first scenario where the doctor said, go for a morning walk in the sunshine every morning for 30 minutes, go to bed 30 minutes earlier, formulate a plan, write it down. How am I going to help my family? How am I going to help my neighbors? How am I going to help my neighborhood to weather this triple storm of pandemic and social upheaval and economic downturn? I need to be a leader in my local community to help us get through this that is going to help depression and anxiety and all the other medical conditions 
orders of magnitude more than that stupid pill that you now have a bottle full that you're going to take every day. Absolutely. That, that makes so much sense. And in India, uh, I, I don't know how it is in, uh, in the US, but in India, it's, it's really, really, this is rampant. And the worst is that uh, we all know that mental anxiety, depression, all of it basically manifests a lot as fibromyalgia. And uh, we've seen so many patients coming in with these weird aches and pains all over the place, which are unexplained and un uh, uh, a whole gamut of investigations from MRI. And the moment you get, do an MRI, you will have all those multiple disc degenerations and all of that going on. And then the story never ends. But yes, I agree with you that the patient is always very... Um, happy and satisfied that I got an MRI done and uh, there were multiple disc degenerations and well, I've been prescribed pregabalin and some other and some anti-anxiety, antidepressants. Uh, we are both doctors. How, how do you think? I, I'm actually facing a, a huge struggle currently in my country because uh, uh, when I, I'm trying to do, uh, you know, uh, counsel the patients that, uh, well, you could look into dietary modifications, you could look into all those things, which I have said, you could look into physiotherapy as well, you could look into pressure point releases, but I am met definitely by a lot of resistance from the patient's point of view. Uh, how do you, Dr. Berry, how do you tackle these, these situations? What yeah, you and you're absolutely right. The chronic pain is intimately linked to depression and anxiety. Chronic it. fatigue is intimately linked Absolutely. to depression and anxiety. Uh, uh, chronic, uh, even neuropathy and fibromyalgia mm -hmm. are directly linked. And so perhaps what's causing the, the neuropathy or the chronic fatigue or the depression, maybe they're all caused by the same thing and they're just different manifestations, different mm -hmm symptom bouquets of the same underlying problem, which in my opinion is a, a, a diet filled with too many carbohydrates and too many inflammatory foods. I have a hypothesis that human beings are by design low carbohydrate Absolutely. animals, okay? And so just like if you take a, a lion or a tiger, and you try to feed them a diet that's full of whole grains mm -hmm. and non-GMO fruit juice, freshly squeezed, they're going to get fat. They're going to get fatty liver. They're going to get diabetes. They're going to get, I guarantee you, they have joint pain. They have depression. They have fatigue. And they're going to die an early painful death because that is not a feline appropriate diet. That's Absolutely. not an appropriate diet for a lion or a tiger or for your house cat at home. They are carnivores. Mm -hmm. And if you don't feed them a carnivore diet, they get fat, they get fatty liver, they get type 2 diabetes, they lay around, they, their skin, their, their hair, their, their, everything is terrible because you're not feeding them the nutrition that their body needs for mm -hmm. optimal function. Mm -hmm. And I think that same concept applies to human beings. We are by design a low carbohydrate animal, animal that should have at least some animal products in our diet. And that doesn't mean you have to eat, you know, three pounds of, of beef or uh, whatever every day. It doesn't have to be that. But you, uh, we are designed to eat animal products. And so uh, I think that's not optional for optimal human health. Eating, uh, eating some sort of animal products in your daily diet is part of a proper human diet. And limiting grains, limiting sugar, whether the sugar is added or natural, trying to eliminate vegetable seed oils that are made in a chemical factory and trying to eat more of the good healthy fats. All of that stuff is part of a proper human diet. Humans are not designed to eat a diet that's mostly grains. Even though we're taught by the powers that be that that is the healthiest diet, is to eat a, a diet that's very heavy on, on grains and, and beans, that, that's really not the proper human diet. Absolutely. And the problem we are facing in our my country is also that um, it's, a, it's predominantly a vegetarian country. And yes. um, uh, I do try to counsel my, 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 my patients, my clients that at least start with eggs. If not eggs, at least cottage cheese, which was very, very common in our Indian households. However, um, 
it, it's really difficult and that is one reason uh, especially in women you know I've seen that it's the women who because of religious cultural spiritual various other causes are uh, very very hardcore vegetarian the men somehow manage to go to uh, whatever parties and their offices and ultimately uh, it's it's how this is cu this cultural uh, thing exists in in india and they do end up having which whenever i see a family it's the man of the uh, house is still having some uh, at least eggs women are pretty much um, hardcore vegetarians and that is one reason why i am seeing a lot of these uh, uh, depression hidden depression which manifests as chronic fatigue syndrome as depression as all of these in what could we do for those people and do you think you know on any uh, supplementation and uh, we will be talking also about magnesium your favorite and my favorite topic both but uh, what do we what do i do to such people how do we help them i think the best way that you can help them is to help them understand you are a human being and your your creator would never ask you to eat a diet that is not a proper human diet that would be built in torture and i don't think any i don't think anyone believes that their creator would ask them to eat a diet that leads to obesity fatty liver type 2 diabetes chronic fatigue chronic pain i don't think any anyone's creator would ask that of them and so I, you can absolutely eat a ketogenic diet as a vegetarian. Now, if you're a vegan, it's gonna be very, very difficult, yeah. if not impossible, to get all of the amino acids and fatty acids you need and all the vitamins and minerals. But if you'll include just a few animal products into your vegetarian diet, and so <clears throat> I talk all the time about an ovo-lacto-pescatarian vegetarian diet. If you can implement Sorry about that. Am I back no, no, now? No worries. Okay. So if you can imp if you can implement if you can add eggs to your diet or at least egg yolks, mm -hmm. that egg yolks, especially if it's from pastured chickens that were able to run around and eat grass and eat bugs, those egg yolks are a superfood multivitamin. Absolutely. Okay. So just adding three egg yolks a day to your vegetarian diet is going to help you tremendously. Mm -hmm. If you can add some kind of fish to your to your vegetarian diet, fish are not mammals, fish don't have faces, fish don't nurse and, and take care of their young. They are, they are not animals in the way we think of animals, right? And so, I mean, I'm even opposed to eating certain animals. I would never eat a dolphin. I would never eat a monkey because that's too close to home for me. So mm -hmm. I understand. Mm -hmm. but, but eating an egg is not going to i don't think that's an unethical action Absolutely. eating fish eating oily fish right that's i don't consider that an unethical action if you could add some shellfish or some crustaceans to your vegetarian mm -hmm. diet mm -hmm. some oysters some clams some shrimp i don't know and i don't know you know all the all the details of the the major religions there in india so i don't know if those are okay or not okay if you could add some fatty meat from uh, a goat meat, fatty goat meat, or use the rendered fat from, mm -hmm. from goats or from chickens or from fish or from, uh, you know, some, some other animal to implement those fats into your diet, to implement those proteins into your diet and the huge plethora of vitamins and minerals that they'll mm -hmm. bring to your diet. Just adding those few things to your diet is going to eliminate many vitamin and mineral deficiencies. You're going to be getting many, many more B vitamins and magnesium, which as you know, are associated with symptoms of depression. If you're not getting enough of those vitamins and minerals, you're gonna be more likely to feel depressed. But also by adding those foods, you're gonna subtract and get rid of all the sweetened, sugary, processed, cookie cakes, pies. There's no nutrition in those. Those are not real food. Those are pseudo food. You're going to get rid of the rice, the wheat, the oats, and the corn. You're going to get rid of the potatoes because there's no meaningful nutrition in any of those. They're Nothing. just simple carbohydrates that are going to spike your blood sugar, therefore spike your insulin, therefore make you store fat, get fatter, 
make you store fat in your liver. That's non-alcoholic fatty liver disease that we have an epidemic of in India and the U.S. Yes. It's going to cause you to develop prediabetes and ultimately type 2 diabetes. <clears throat> so if you keep eating all the grains and all the potatoes and all the beans, you're going to wind up being an obese type 2 diabetic with fatty liver who has chronic joint pain and who's chronically always, you know, mentally down in the dumps because you just don't feel like doing anything because you're in, you have no energy and you have chronic pain. All of that is coming from the diet that is not a proper human diet for you. Absolutely. I completely agree with you. And at least uh, uh, I am trying my level best to encourage people to start with the, with at least with eggs. It's, it's just so, uh, so distressing to me when uh, the, even the type one diabetic children are they, they are they are not eating eggs because their parents are not eating eggs and they are hardcore vegetarians. It's so difficult to yeah. counsel them. You know they are they will be willing to uh, give any form of insulin, anything uh, possible, any high doses of insulin, but they will not start eggs. It's yeah, and I think that's an excellent first step. I love that you're emphasizing that. <clears throat> If, if you could just start having three eggs cooked in butter or ghee as your breakfast, just, just that one change alone yes. would make a humongous difference, not only in how you feel, but your energy level. It would help with multiple problems. And for the type 1 diabetic children, they wouldn't have to use nearly as much insulin overall Absolutely. if they would have that breakfast. And, and what the parents of type 1 diabetics need to understand is that if you have a chronically high level of insulin in your body, whether it's your own insulin you made or whether it's exogenous insulin that you've injected into your little one, it is not healthy to have high levels of insulin in your body. Insulin is the fat storage hormone. It's going to make your little one store fat. It's going to make your little one store fat in their liver, which mm -hmm. is very dangerous. Mm -hmm. It's going to contribute to chronic hyperinsulinemia in your little one which is going to lead to chronic inflammation and, and chronic weight gain. It's mm -hmm. not a good thing. I'd much rather you eat some naturally occurring human appropriate foods like eggs and ghee than to inject your little one cr constantly with a, a, a synthetic insulin, which is leading to chronic disease. Absolutely. Um this is quite a struggle and there are there is a long way ahead in our country where yeah, i mean even oh, i keep seeing on even on twitter where there's a very small um, a segment of the population which is active on twitter that it's so difficult to get the message across even there and this is like we are targeting so much of our population and it's it's quite a struggle ahead and uh, that is the reason i will be posting all of this data we we, we ha i have a very good friend of mine who's the technical wizard behind all of this. He will be editing all of this, posting it on YouTube, trying to spread the message over and over and over, re-emphasize. I think that is what is, uh, it, it has to be word of mouth that maybe in a, a one type one diabetic child improves and then they tell the rest of the people that, okay, we just added eggs, you know, those made all the difference. So I am looking forward to maybe 10 years ahead because uh, this has to be a very slow process and I'm sure you have been yeah. struggling uh, with it for quite some time. Uh, I know you've been really, you know, struggling, doing such great work about it. And that is exactly what I'm trying my best to do. And depression and mental health is, a, is specifically a topic which is close to my heart because uh, I have been through it. It, it. I There was a phase in my life when I was, that was a time when I moved and learned about all this and moved into all this. If I hadn't, if I hadn't known, if I hadn't moved, uh, I would have been 20 uh, kgs overweight, depressed, chronically fatigued and down in the dumps. And uh, it's it, it made so much of difference to my life. I just can't begin to. And again, the day I add stuff like uh, more nutrient dense food like liver, mutton, red meat in my diet, uh, it's like I have this whole burst of energy and I'm just never tired so yep, it's just, absolutely you the, the thing is that i keep telling people that you have to you have to uh, experience it you have to experience how it's living without brain fog how it's living without those joint aches and pains and when you experience it 
then you will know how how life changes yeah. and uh, with that i would like to ask you what about dementia what about alzheimers because again in india we are seeing um, i think even above the ages of 50 people are being uh, having problems of dementia and early onset alzheimers parkinsons all of these are they linked to uh, improper nutrition as well it sure appears that they are because <clears throat> here in the US and also in India there are epidemics of alzheimer's mm -hmm. dementia of other mm -hmm. dementias of the neurological conditions like parkinsons uh they've always been with us but not at the current rate not at the current prevalence it seems Absolutely. like they're much more prevalent now than they used to be and i uh, some doctors will say well that's because we're better at diagnosing it now but uh parkinsonism is not difficult to diagnose a, a first year medical student can see someone with parkinsons and they know immediately what that is. And so I don't think it's a, a diagnostic improvement. I think that we're having more cases of parkinsons and alzheimers and I think it's directly related to the amount of of grains and the amount of industrial vegetable oils that we're eating in our diets. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important for people to understand these are new foods to the human species mm. we've only been eating vegetable oil vegetable seed oils that are made in a factory we've only mm -hmm. been eating those for a few decades mm -hmm. there have never been any long term studies proving beyond a shadow of a doubt that corn oil or soybean oil or canola oil or peanut oil none of these things have ever been shown to be safe for long term consumption in human beings And so I don't think if you have something cooked in canola oil one time, I don't think that's going to not a big deal at all. It's not an acute poison. I think it's a long-term slow inflammatory poison that over decades and decades of using canola or soybean oil or corn oil or peanut oil every single day, it leads to chronic inflammation not only in your body but also in your brain. Mm -hmm. And you know, doctor that uh big pharma the corporations have been trying to come up with a pill that treats alzheimers like crazy they they've spent billions of dollars and they can't do it and i think and i think it's because it's caused by what we're eating and so there's no pill that's going to erase that or undo the damage once the damage is done it's done uh but i think by changing a person's diet you can slow down the progression towards parkinsons or towards alzheimers or the other neurological conditions maybe you can reverse the damage a little bit but i don't know if you can reverse all the damage but i think you can absolutely prevent someone from developing premature huntingtons or parkinsons or uh, alzheimers and definitely slow down or stop the progression if they've already started down that road but you can only slow down that progression or stop that progression by feeding them a proper human diet that their body was meant to eat not a diet that the big food corporations tell you is healthy and ethical which includes lots of grains lots of sugars and lots of industrial vegetable oil absolutely and and of course the myth which is again propagated that the elderly do not need protein they always have to be on a hypocaloric diet so the poor elderly citizens are just you know having again and they eating some little grain from bed for breakfast and again some more little bit of grain and you tell them where is the protein in your diet and they'll be saying why well, we don't need it we are not doing any physical activity we don't need it and it's just so <clears throat> tragic it's it's just so it tragic. is very tragic because even a even a human being who's completely sedentary i mean does no physical uh, activity all day long they still need 1 gram of protein per kilogram of body weight in order to maintain not only their because everybody thinks about muscle but people don't understand your bones are made of collagen mm -hmm. they're made of 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 the the protein that you eat in your diet that's what mm -hmm. keeps your bones strong is eating protein that's what keeps your muscle strong definitely it's also what keeps your tendons and your ligaments and your cartilage strong all those things are made of protein also your brain is made of fat and protein right every organ of your body your kidneys are made of protein you have to have a milli, a, a gram per kilogram of body weight of protein per day to keep all of your bones muscles and organs functioning properly protein is not optional if you don't eat enough protein in your diet you will suffer
Absolutely. Completely, completely. So much agreed with it. And it's, it's a huge, <laughs> huge uphill struggle, huge uphill struggle. And uh, uh, regarding supplementations, uh, especially in, I'm asking in the context of a vegetarian diet in India, what I, what do you think if at, okay, at least if they are maybe adding a couple of eggs, difficult that they will add more than a couple of eggs, because again, this whole thing about the saturated fat and the egg yolks, but uh, what, uh, what would you think are the, are the supplements which are pretty much mandatory? At, at least yeah, the- and I, again, I want to I want to talk about the food because I think that's the most important thing. If you can just add two eggs, cooked in ghee, yeah, and and a little bit of goat cheese or sheep cheese that's full fat cheese with those that that one tiny meal a day is going to give you all the fatty acids, amino acids, vitamins, and minerals your body needs. Mm-hmm. If you just refuse to do that and you're only and you're going to eat a vegan diet then there's a long list of supplements that you absolutely have to take. You have to take a long list of artificial supplements Mm -hmm. in order to keep your body from breaking down and, and, and suffering on a vegan diet. And Mm -hmm. first of all, if you're just a common sense individual, that ought to sound very odd to you. You ought to say, so, so I'm being told by my creator or by my guru or by, the powers that be that I should eat a diet that is nutritionally deficient and will make my body break down prematurely. Is that, does that make common sense? Cause that to me, I, that doesn't make any sense. Absolutely. It's just like if I try to feed my house cat, uh, wheat and pea protein and, uh, uh lettuce, my cat's <laughs> going to look at me like I'm stupid, right? Like what is wrong with you? I'm a cat. I need yeah, meat. That's absolutely. what I need. And so I would, I would urge everyone to consider the common sense implications of, of believing that you should eat a diet that is nutritionally deficient. Look at the common sense. Uh, it just doesn't make common sense to feed your little children a diet that is not helping to make their bones stronger, that is not helping their muscles to grow, that is not helping their brain to develop. Do you really believe that that is the healthiest diet for your little children? I, I, that, that just beggars belief for me. And I hope that people will think about this, not from a, a philosophical or a religious. Don't, don't think, just think of it. You are, you are responsible for feeding your children a diet that helps them to grow into successful, robust, vigorous, intelligent adult people. Don't you want them to be that? Don't you want your children to grow up and be healthy and strong and successful? Because if you're feeding them a diet that is full of nutritional deficiencies, that is deficient in in the vitamins and the minerals and the amino acids and the fatty acids they need to, to build a body and a mind that can be successful in today's times, that doesn't seem very ethical to me. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. But, uh, and, Yet, I think uh, if, if yet after all this, if they are maybe not adding all, the, all of this to their diet, because it sometimes becomes a real cultural struggle here in our country. Uh, do you think then at least B12 has to be added? And of course, well, like I, the- I, think, I think B12 is one of the many things that needs to be added. Yeah. And I'm actually, uh, I'm working on a YouTube video right now about the multiple vitamins and minerals and other um, supplements that you need to take on a vegan diet. Uh If you're not going to eat any animal products, there is a long list of supplements. B12 is is first and foremost among them, but there are multiple other things that you just cannot get from eating plants. It does not exist in the plant foods. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what about magnesium? I I personally, in my (laughs) health, I feel a lot of difference with magnesium, I've been taking it since quite some while. Uh, yep. Yes, of course, I know now you're going to say, eat your leafy greens. <laughs> so, but the problem in our country is again, that we, we sometimes do not get good quality leafy greens. The soil is deficient and yes. all of And that's things. a huge problem, the soil deficiency. Yeah. And so people need to understand if your vegetables grow in a soil 
that is is depleted of magnesium, mm -hmm. of potassium, of mm -hmm. iodine, another mm -hmm. big, very important one. If there is no none of those minerals in the soil, then it is impossible for there to be any of those minerals Absolutely. in the vegetables, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so if you look up how much how many milligrams of magnesium does broccoli have? Mm -hmm. You'll see a number there. But if that if the broccoli that you're about to eat was grown in soil that's deficient in magnesium, that broccoli will not have that much magnesium in it. Magnesium is an element. And the only way to make an element is nuclear fusion. Mm -hmm. And broccoli cannot do nuclear fusion. Only the sun can do that, right? And so that broccoli cannot make magnesium. If it's not in the soil, then it does not exist in the broccoli mm -hmm. and you're, you're eating a, a, a magnesium deficient broccoli and you mm -hmm. have no idea because you looked it up on the internet and it said that broccoli had so many milligrams of magnesium, but it all depends on the soil that the vegetables are grown in. And that's a, that, I think that's a huge problem that we're just now learning about is many of our soils due to monocropping are completely depleted mm -hmm. of multiple minerals. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm trying to address this problem, but this is a sticky problem to address but because how do you tell people the very food that you're harvesting from the earth, it has a third of the magnesium that it had even 50 years ago. And in exactly. some ways, for some of the minerals, it has 90% less of, of boron or manganese or iodine. They're, they're almost completely deficient because mm -hmm. the soils are depleted. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out a way to address that. And I hope so, somebody comes up with a way soon because mineral deficiency is a huge, huge problem. Magnesium being one of the most important minerals that we should be getting every day. Absolutely. And uh, I, I, it, it's made, it made a huge difference in my life. And uh, it's uh, basically thanks to all of you because I've been consistently following all, the, all your work and that's how I became aware of magnesium. I added it to my, uh, to my life and I added it to many people's life. And it's uh, including all those tips about Epsom salt and uh, all of these, they, they really work. They really work. So actually, yeah, I, while, while I was watching your video, that's what I suddenly heard, oh, I have to, you know, do the Epsom salt trick. So then, you know, it, it, it works so well. And it's such a, such a simple thing just to soak your feet yeah. in Epsom salt. And I think, again, this is a very common sense uh, situation. If you don't feel well and you add magnesium to your diet mm -hmm. and then you feel better, mm -hmm. then by definition, you were deficient in magnesium, Absolutely. regardless Absolutely. of what your blood work said, because your serum magnesium level, your body very tightly controls that. It'll pull right. magnesium out of your muscles, out mm -hmm. of your bones. It'll pull magnesium from anywhere to keep your serum blood level of magnesium within a tight normal limit mm -hmm. and so you can go to your doctor and have your magnesium level checked and it might look completely normal that does not mean that you don't suffer from a severe magnesium deficiency that goes for all the minerals that goes for sodium chloride potassium magnesium iodine your body keeps these at a very narrow level of normal in your serum mm. and so you can be severely de deficient and have a normal blood level of that element of that mineral. Absolutely, I, I com completely agree. And uh, uh, those little, uh, we keep talking about macronutrients, and the it's sometimes it's just the micronutrients which are. Uh, I, I remember my own daughter suffering terribly from the night cramps, and both uh, all our family being doctors, we were unable to understand what's going wrong. And yep. thanks to following your work, I just, all I did was add magnesium. And since then, you know, she's never ever suffered. And I am a lot, a very um, a great fitness and enthusiast and I'm a runner as well. So I am very disciplined about taking my magnesium in spite of eating my leafy greens, but I'm sure all the leafy greens yeah. are completely deficient in magnesium here. Probably. And, uh, I, I, Dr. Berry, now I would definitely like to ask about something which is one of your very favorite topics and I've almost seen all your uh, YouTube videos is when we come to intermittent fasting and the common common things you feel that where we are going wrong in, on intermittent fasting. 
Yeah, so intermittent fasting is a, is a, a very basic concept. And so anytime you have a very basic concept, that's also a very powerful concept. Mm -hmm. You're going to have multiple people try to come in and make that more complicated so that they can then write a book about it, or they can sell a product, they can sell a supplement. So intermittent fasting is basically the practice of not eating for a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. that, that is what fasting is. Mm -hmm. And so there's no need to complicate that. To, yeah. to complicate it actually makes it less usable by the common man and woman on mm -hmm. the street. It's a very, very powerful metabolic tool, a health tool, a nutrition tool for not only helping you burn fat, which is going to lead to the weight loss that you may be looking for, but it's also going to lower levels of inflammation. It's also going to raise your hormone levels, multiple of your hormones, back to a normal level. It's going to lower your insulin level. <laughs> and remember, insulin is a fat storage hormone. Absolutely. It's going to lower the insulin level back down to low normal, which is going to help you burn fat for fuel, which is what weight loss is. But yeah, people come along and they try to complicate mm -hmm. the fats. They try to say, oh, you have to drink this green juice, or you have to eat this root or this herb or you have to, you know, none of that stuff is necessary. Fasting means not eating for a period of time. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what, what on a, what do you recommend? I generally get confused about whether I should, you know, just do one of those 18, six or a 24 or <clears throat> a lot of people are advocating longer fasts and, what do you say uh, on a day-to-day -day general basis for a person, for a woman like me who's moderately active, I exercise, I eat clean, I stay as low carb as possible, almost bordering towards keto. What would you say is something best which could be followed on a day-to-day -day life, uh, life? Yeah. So all of us fast every single day when we're asleep. Mm -hmm. So every day, every person listening to this, you fast for anywhere from six to nine hours every single day of your life. Mm -hmm. That's a fast. You're not mm -hmm. eating. And so the easiest way to implement intermittent fasting I found in my practice is to just add an hour after you mm -hmm. don't eat for an hour after you wake up and then stop eating one hour before you go to bed. Mm -hmm. Now, let's say you sleep for eight hours. Now, and so you were fasting for eight hours, but if you add an hour on each end of your sleep, now you're fasting for 10 hours. Mm -hmm. It's not hard to do. That's easy. You can wait an hour after you get up to eat. Mm -hmm. You can stop eating an hour before you go to bed. And when you get used to that after a few weeks or even a month or two, then you can add another hour on each side. Now you're, you have a 12 hour fast and you're starting to be able to notice a benefit that uh, when you're fasting for 12 hours, you're going to start to notice a little fat loss. You're going to start to notice a little bit of decrease in your chronic inflammation. Mm. And so once you're used to that, after a few weeks or a month or two, you can add another hour on each end. Now you're fasting for 14 hours a day, right? And that's, and so you've got 10 hours of the day that you can eat in. That's plenty. You can eat three meals in that 10 hours. You can eat four meals in that 10 hours but fast for that 14 hours. And now we start coming to the point where research is actually showing an improvement if you fast for 14 hours a day. And uh, you can continue to increase that. And so for me, just on an average day, I will fast anywhere from 20 to 22 hours every single day. And so some days I'll eat one meal that entire day. Some days I'll eat two meals, but mm -hmm. I'll keep those two meals within a four hour window. Mm -hmm. So for 20 hours, every single day of my life, effortlessly, because I eat a very high fat, high protein diet, mm -hmm. that makes it much easier to do the intermittent fasting. I'm not hungry. I haven't eaten today. It's, it's what, 10, 11 o'clock. I won't eat today until probably 3 or 4 p.m. Mm -hmm. I'm just not hungry. I'm, I'm in my office. I'm working. I'm trying to help people. I don't have time to eat every two hours. And so intermittent fasting is a very powerful tool for me, not only for fat loss, not only for decreasing inflammation, but, in, but increasing my number of hours that I could actually do productive work to help other people. Oh, yes. And so I don't think everyone needs to do a 22-hour everyday fast. I, mm -hmm. uh, most, many people won't need that. Most people will start to notice the benefits when they get up to somewhere between a 14-hour daily fast and an 18-hour daily fast. Somewhere yeah. in that range, you'll start to notice very quick fat burning, which is what mm -hmm. weight loss is. You'll notice that your joints are not as achy. 
You'll notice that your mind is clearer. You'll notice that, and, and some people fast for religious reasons, and I have great respect for that because I think all of the major religions recognize the both the spiritual power of fasting, but also the physical and the mental power of fasting. Fasting is one of the most, most powerful health tools, both for spiritual health and for physical health, that human beings have access to on this planet. And very important point, it's free. You know, it does not cost you one penny to fast unless you're listening to some guru who says you need this special mountain root or this special valley herb, then it might cost you some money. But if you do fa fasting the old fashioned way, which is just not eating, it's free. No matter how poor you are, you can start today to improve your health by doing some intermittent fasting every day. Absolutely. And that's so true because not only do we improve our health, we save up on time, we save up on resources and it's, it's just so much of freedom. Uh, I completely, completely agree. And uh, I have to explain to people that intermittent fasting doesn't mean hunger. As you said that it's, it's never about hunger. In fact, the hunger completely goes down. It's like a like you can plan your meal okay now now it's fine we can we have time and we can sit down and make a nice meal for ourselves rather than going crazy with hypoglycemia and hunger and that's something which we have to i have to really uh, educate the people about that the fasting never means being hungry the fasting yep. is that when you are eating you have to eat your protein and your fat and so that if you're satiated, if you're not feeling satiated, if you're feeling hungry during the fast, means you've done done something wrong when you've been eating, and it's like people are so used to having those hypocaloric diets where they are supposed to eat those three peanuts, then half a spoon of curd, <laughs> then something yep. else. And, and let's make a let's make an important distinction between fasting and what you're talking about, mm -hmm. which is chronic calorie restriction or starvation. Yes. So when, when you eat, you know, one little bite of cheese for breakfast and then have one little spoon of, of bean curd for snack and then have a tiny salad for lunch, that is a starvation diet. That diet actually has negative health consequences. That diet will actually lower your metabolic rate. That diet will keep you focused on food constantly yes, because you're yes. constantly hungry. You're oh. constantly waiting. When is my, how many hours to my next snack? How many mm -hmm. hours to my next meal? I'm starving. That is a starvation diet. Whereas fasting is the complete opposite of that. Absolutely. And all my life, I, I, in spite of being a doctor, struggled with that kind of diet, the hypocaloric diet. Oh my goodness. I was crazed out of my mind because that's what used to happen. I used to be looking at my watch all the time and be thinking that, now this is the, that it's another small snack box which I have to open and now I have to take out those four almonds from that and eat it. <laughs> oh my goodness! It was yeah. it was just it was just horrible. I mean, I've been through all of those and those were those were really crazy times. Thank God that I'm away from all of this. And uh, it's this is uh, this is I think the the main thing which. Uh, uh, which I have seen, which people are not still be able to get their minds wrapped around is that you have to eat well during your, because they are so scared of eating well. They do, when you, when you tell them that eat well, they look at you aghast. But okay. Could, can I really eat well? I mean, because all their lives, they have been uh, told to exercise more and eat less that they are <clears throat> unable to, yep. to make them eat those, those that much amount of good quality protein and fat is another struggle yeah <laughs> and so for for the ketogenic way of eating or the low carb way of eating to work long term and to be fun and to be sustainable you have to eat until you are comfortably full mm -hmm. the there's a reason that we breathe a certain time uh, how many times a minute that we do it's because we need that much oxygen and we mm -hmm. need to blow off that much carbon dioxide. And so the has telling someone to, to move more and eat less is like telling someone, look, you've been breathing way too much here lately that you're very gluttonous. You need to, you need to only breathe 10 times a minute and no more. That makes exactly as much common sense as telling someone stop eating before you're comfortably full. That is not a normal physiological request. Every animal on the planet eats until it's full. Then it walks away from its meal. 
that's how that, that's how we've done it for for the 99.9 percent .9 of our time on this planet that's how every wild animal does it they don't they don't eat a palm-sized portion of whatever mm -hmm. and then say oh i'm done and for two hours i don't need to eat again they eat until they're comfortably full then they stop eating we have to also mimic that the same goes for for our blood flow your heart has to beat so many times a minute in order to move enough blood around to keep you alive and to keep you optimized. What if some guru came to you and said, look, you're being very gluttonous, and very slothy. <laughs> your, your, your heart's been beating 80 times a minute mm -hmm. for, for your entire life. And it's, it's time for you to stop being selfish. And it's time for you to, to make your heart only beat 50 times a minute. It's not fair to the other people that you're letting your heart beat so many times on its face, that sounds ridiculous. You're like, what? I, 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 my, I have to have a heart rate of what I have to have in order to stay alive. The same goes for your food. The same concept applies. If you're hungry, eat real human appropriate food. Mm -hmm. Eat that food until you are full and then stop eating. And do not eat again until you are truly hungry again. That's how every animal on this planet does it. That's how we should do it too. Absolutely. I totally, totally agree with you. And I hope that we uh, try to spread this word as far as possible so that, though, of course, I know you don't want to talk about it, but I am, yeah, so, uh, but I am pretty much convinced and as were uh, all the rest of my renowned esteemed speakers who had joined me is that this pandemic could have been averted if we all had great metabolic health and no i, I totally agree the the so and let's talk about that for just a second if you don't mind yeah absolutely becoming infected by any virus not just this current virus that mm -hmm. we hear about every minute of every day mm -hmm. even the influenza virus even mm -hmm. uh cold and sniffle viruses mm -hmm. even uh, every virus you are more likely to become infected by a virus if you are eating a diet that weakens your immune system. Mm -hmm. And I actually have two or three videos on my YouTube channel about which kinds of diets strengthen your immune system. Mm -hmm. It is well known in human physiology that when you eat a meal that contains lots of carbohydrates, mm -hmm. which break down immediately into sugar, mm -hmm. that lowers the ability of your innate immune system to fight off infection within Absolutely. minutes. Mm -hmm. of eating that diet, mm -hmm. your phagocytes stop working as well. They, they're, they stop being able to adhere. They stop being able to roll. They stop being able to, to migrate. That is your immune system. And so when you, when, when you eat a diet that's full of sugar, or full of grains, full of potatoes, full of starchy beans, and that raises your blood sugar, you have immediately weakened your immune system. There's no, that, there's no debate about that. That is settled physiological science. We can watch the phagocytes become clumsy and become unable to adhere and become unable to go between the endothelial cells when you eat a high sugar diet. So whether you're eating just sugar like desserts, cakes, cookies, pies, or whether you're eating a, a, a diet filled with whole grains that have been stone ground and are non-GMO, all of those things still break down immediately into sugar. And if you don't believe me, if you have diabetes test strips, take a piece of whole wheat bread and stick it in your mouth and chew it up for 30 seconds and then touch the strip to your tongue and get some of the saliva on your, on your strip and put it in your machine and see what it says. You'll immediately realize whole wheat bread is made of long strings of sugar and an enzyme in your mouth called amylase, immediately starts to break down those starches into sugar. Stop thinking that grains are somehow wholesome and, and magical. Grains are just sugar in a different form. Absolutely. I so agree. And what is most amazing to me is it's not a rocket science. The moment I started reading about all of this and understanding it, it just clicked. It, it didn't take me long to understand or to debate or to argue or to disagree or to throw tantrums. It is a little unfortunate that even we doctors are, you know, not not trying to, what may I say, um, 
unlearn and relearn or at least experiment with our own selves. I've done all sorts of experiments with my own self, even uh, to the extent of re-adding all the grains and all of this back into my life. I did this this winters and I said, okay, let me try to see it. I know I'm insulin resistant and even without that, I just let me try. It was a horrible phase. I was feeling that brain fog which creeps in, the feeling of fatigue, the feeling of lethargy. It's just so horrible. I took before we start trying to educate the lay pe- laymen and and our uh, our other our country people we doctors have a moral and so- social obligation of at least trying to experiment on ourselves but i just Absolutely. don't know where why there is so much of resistance against against you know even even trying to just maybe for a month try it on on your own self it doesn't help you it's fine but if it does well, then it's going to make all the change. Yes, I totally, totally agree 100%. And I applaud the, the great work you're doing in India. And hopefully one day soon, I'll be able to come and maybe we can have a conference together. I'd love to meet you in person. Absolutely. But it's been a great pleasure and honor to, to talk with you today. And I'm more than willing to do this again in the future if you'd like. Absolutely. It's been, it's been my pleasure. And how much time do you have? How many more questions can we ask? Because I have pretty much long list. Are you, are you, are you comfortable? Could I ask you a couple of questions more? We probably need to wrap it up for today, but definitely we can do, we can do round two coming okay. up in the next few weeks and we can Absolutely. answer more questions and help. More Absolutely. People. I think then maybe we, we would just focus on, um, uh, specifically what uh, is another ground path breaking work which you have done is all the thyroid and the menopause issues and that would be something great to t- talk about and uh, if anything uh, dr ken if you would like to share with us as a take home message something you would like <coughs> to see of course it, eat a diet which is meant for humans but apart from that anything specific you would like to tell us well, I think that we could talk about doctors here at the end, since I wrote the book, Lies My Doctor Told Me. <laughs> so at, at, at my most metabolically ill, I, I was morbidly obese and a pre-diabetic. Yeah. Right? Now, did I, did I in any way, uh, did I have a, a right to be giving nutrition advice to my patients? No. No. I, I couldn't even fix my own metabolic health. Absolutely. So how in the world did I feel justified to walk into my patient's office and look at them and say, well, you need to lose some weight and you need to, <laughs> you need to do this, that, and the other. If a patient had stood up and, and looked me in the eye and said, doctor, why should I listen to you? You can't even fix yourself. I would have had to agree. I would have had to say, no, you're right. I, I obviously don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, and so I would caution everybody out there, if your doctor is morbidly obese, if your doctor has fatty liver disease, if your doctor, definitely if your doctor has type two diabetes or pre-diabetes, <laughs> then always be respectful to your elders and your doctor, but don't necessarily blindly take their advice about nutrition and health because obviously they've still got a few things to figure out. <laughs> Absolutely right. And that is one reason where when somebody tells me also, uh, I have now started doing this as well. If somebody tells me, show me the articles, show me the research, because unfortunately, research, the published papers are still coming. I, I tell people, well, I am the research. So you, could, you, can, you can see me and you can see your other friendly neighborhood doctor. And I think I am a standing example, as are all exactly. of you. Because Yes, you every know. doctor. Uh, just, and so you could say every hairdresser <laughs> should have a really good hair stop. <laughs> That makes sense. Every good mechanic, their car should run flawlessly, yeah. right? And every good doctor or nutritionist or dietitian ought to be a, a picture of good metabolic health. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it makes you doubt their, their um, bona fides. Absolutely. I so agree. And it's been a pleasure, Dr. Ken, to be, to have you here with us. And really, I mean, I'm feeling so excited about talking to you face to face after seeing your YouTube videos. I, I, so many of those uh, are, I really memorized them by heart. And uh, whenever I have an, any, any, any problem, any confusion, I just go to your videos and it's, it's just so great having you. And we will definitely take this, uh, 
uh, at a further level to uh, discuss some more topics. And yes. uh, thank you for taking out your time. Uh, After a lot of confusion we had about Mondays and Tuesdays. but It's such a pleasure you. talking with you. And I can't wait to uh, go to Chapter 2 and talk about Absolutely. more things. We will. Thank you so much. And thank greetings you. from India all over again. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.